Hey everybody, it's Chris Franchese here from Dickinson College Commentaries. Uh, this is a version of a talk that I gave uh, under the auspices of Brown University in March of 2021. Very kindly was invited by a group of graduate students to talk about uh, DCC and about uh, especially the notion of creative digitization. And that's what I want to focus on today. DCC started in 2010. Uh, and it was supposed to be like the Bryn Mawr commentary series, that is uh, just classical text with some uh, brief notes for readers, uh, but we were gonna do it online. In practice, it ended up including a lot of uh, digitization. Uh, and I, I have ended up enjoying this a great deal and I found it very valuable and helpful. And I wanna try and persuade you that uh, this, what I'm calling creative digitization is worthwhile and that there's much more of it to be done and uh, finally to consider, ask you to consider including this kind of thing as part of your scholarly activity in the future. The concept is really to take an existing high quality resource, enrich it and transform it with uh, new data and to make it into an open educational resource intended to make the reader's life easier or more interesting. The, the goals are really three. We want to, and this is really the goal, whole goal of DCC is to make reading the original language is easier. Um, and also, uh, you know, at the same time to expand access to folks who don't have a, um, a large library in their neighborhood. Uh, and then <clears throat> finally to, really this is the access that the aspect that I'm going to focus on today to globalize um, classics by bringing historical traditions into dialogue with each other. And I think there's a special potential there for this going forward. Um, as I say, we began in 2010 with the C Gallic War of Caesar. This was because there was a need at that time for an open commentary because Caesar had just been added to the uh, advanced placement syllabus in, in, um, uh, in, in Latin. So the teachers were anxious about having something they could use. So I, with the help of some students, uh, put up a commentary. We didn't do a fresh commentary. We repurposed the uh, some of the excellent school commentaries that were in the public domain one by this fellow uh, t rice holmes outstanding historian he's very good on geography uh, another one was by the um, a university professor named uh, francis kelsey and he it, despite you know, being at a university had an excellent sense for what it was really helpful for students uh, for young people just encountering uh, uh, Caesar for the first time and so his notes were super valuable in that in that regard we added a bunch of stuff we put on vocabulary lists uh, links to the grammar of Alan and Greeno which we've also digitized some maps and audio uh, and video elements as well so I'll briefly show you what that uh, looks like in practice you see we've got a two column format the the notes are as they say credited to folks like Rice Holmes and Kelsey and you'll see other names in there as well there are hyperlinks to Alan and Greeno. Got these vocabulary lists, that's a key, um, a key aspect, and I'll talk about that in a second. And the media things include stuff like uh, videos that actually have the text read aloud with um, a map animation, so you can actually kind of understand it as you hear it. We've got some podcast stuff. This is a Jay Sammons, wonderful military historian, or just ancient historian from Boston University, talking about Caesar's army. We've got some terrific maps. Some students, um, a student named Dan Plekoff made this astounding a GIS-based map of uh, Caesar's Gallic War. We have digitized um, Beth Edom, another terrific Dickinson student, digitized a ton of um, maps from old school editions. And we have a whole set of maps on uh, by uh, uh, the U.S. Army officer, Antonio Salinas, who teaches at West Point, did these uh, strategy maps with NATO symbology to really give a modern strategic understanding of what Caesar was after. Um, and so, yeah, so that's all there. The, you know, leveraging some, some older resources that are also good. Um, <clears throat> right, so the vocabulary list for me are a key piece because this is the catch-22 of learning any language, I suppose, but especially Greek and Latin. The best way to gain an extensive vocabulary is to read a lot, but it's hard to read a lot when you don't have an extensive vocabulary. Um, so our solution for this is to provide running lists not of every word, but just of the uncommon ones. We have a defined list of a thousand extremely common Latin words that we exclude and, um, and give you all the, all the other ones. Now, creating this for Caesar was extremely time consuming. 
And it was clear going forward that if we we're going to do this, we had to have a better workflow, a better way to create these lists. Um, and Henry Freeze to the rescue when it comes to the Aeneid. We had planned to do the AP selections for the Aeneid as well. And uh, it was just not going to be practicable to create entirely new, fresh vocabulary lists. And of course, the automatic tools of the kind that you have at Perseus and elsewhere are, are flawed because they're, um, they're relying on the computer to sort of distinguish homonyms. And often the definitions come from, say, Lewis and Short, and it's this sort of fire hose of material that's not really relevant. Uh, and just we weren't going to go there to use like the existing open resources. Um, so what we did was digitize this wonderful uh, vocabulary list by Henry, Free Henry Fries, who was just a, a Brown graduate and briefly an instructor at Brown, but spent most of his career at University of Michigan, where he served three terms as acting president. This was an era when university presidents thought it was a good thing to help people read the Aeneid. Uh, yes, the old, the good old days. And uh, his work is astonishingly good, very well <clears throat> um, tailored to reading the Aeneid. Has all the proper names exactly where you want them, and it has citations uh, where the particular meanings that Virgil employs actually occur. So I couldn't imagine a better thing to put in the hands of a of a you know, the reader of the Aeneid to really make the process go more smoothly. Problem is, how are you going to get it out of this book and onto the website in a way that's a running list, not something that you have to go, go look up every word every time? Well, uh, the, the solution there came from a wonderful Belgian research outfit called Lasla. Lasla <clears throat> have been uh, hand parsing and analyzing Greek and Latin since 1961. And they have a database at this point of 1.7 million words of, of Latin, including a fully parsed Aeneid. So they very kindly uh, gave us an Excel file of their fully parsed Aeneid that we were then able to combine <coughs> with Fraser's Dictionary, which we had as a PDF scan already, ran through Abbey Fine Reader, which is an optical character recognition commercially available piece of software. Uh, and that uh, allows us to create an Excel spreadsheet. We then are able to combine that data with the LASLA data, uh, it, which gives us then uh, running lists by location that can be used at DCC. The dictionary itself went to Logeum, the marvelous uh, dictionary site run uh, out of the University of Chicago, which I recommend that you use, and another spectacularly useful project called The Bridge, run by Brett Mulligan at Haverford College, this involves the, this allows you to make a custom vocabulary list for any uh, ancient text that they have in their database. Key to your own knowledge, you can choose the level of vocabulary that you want. So these are, um, you know, sort of data sharing opportunities uh, that we can leverage the freeze data once it's been digitized to um, really help, help readers. So uh, you can see the result in our edition of uh, selections from the Aeneid, where you have a link to the core vocabulary. We're not going to give you the common words, but the less common ones are all there with really accurate and context specific and appropriate definitions that make the reading process smoother. All right, so that to me is a, was a, a terrific success. And uh, I, I want to do more of that. But what do you do if you don't have a parsed text? If Lathley hasn't gotten to something yet. Um, here, uh, Brett Mulligan and I came up with this concept of really repurposing and using old concordances. Oh, sorry, wait, there's, a, there's another benefit from digitizing the freeze is that you can make it searchable. You can use the frequency data to do stylistics, like how common is a particular word in the Aeneid? Well, we know exactly, thanks to Lasla, and we can give you the definition, and of course it's downloadable and shareable as we've been seeing. Right, so uh, the Concordance Liberation Project was an effort to uh, leverage these older reference resources created by uh, uh, folks like uh, William Oldfather at University of Illinois and his, uh, and his teams. These are older works that have lists of every single word in a classical text with every, a citation for every instance. And it's a genre of scholarship that got going in the Renaissance with Bible concordances, but was actually um, very vigorously pursued in the 19th, early 20th century by classicists. Totally defunct now, of course, because we have searchable texts and people don't think it's worthwhile to do this sort of work. 
uh, in the computer age. But in fact, it, it is uh, invaluable because they are hand analyzing and distinguishing homonyms and assigning them to particular dictionary lemmas. So this is what the index Apuleianus looks like. This is a particularly fine example of this genre scholarship. Uh, so we chose it as a sort of test case for this. And um, you can see every word is there with location data. The different works of um, Apuleius are, are abbreviated and they give you the citations from the Teubner editions with some tagging with uh, syntactical to tell you what case something might be in when necessary or what part of speech we're dealing with when that's ambiguous. So this is like really precious a philological a data that's sort of locked away in these books uh, that, you know, think of the thousands and thousands of years of labor, the, the man hours, person hours that went into creating this document. Uh, it just boggles the mind. And if we could only liberate that, it could be helpful um, in, a, in a digital setting. So the steps to do this, this con uh, concordance liberation process, involve some serious data analysis. You have to analyze the abbreviations, the different orthographical conventions. In this case, anything in brackets derives from the apparatus criticus, not from the text itself. So we didn't actually want to use that. Um, the, once you analyze the data, um, you, you can sort of know how to handle it. We, the step two was to have it digitized professionally by a company called NuGen in India. Uh, this was a moderately expensive uh, endeavor that was helped out by a, a small grant from the Society for Classical Studies. So thank you to the SCS for fostering this work. Once you've got the digitized version, NuGen did some basic tagging, including uh, a little HTML tag that tells you, hey, this is a new dictionary lemma that's starting right now, and this is where that dictionary lemma ends, and here's where the next one starts. They also tagged for some orthographic stuff like um, uh, italics, and superscript and, and um, you know, the very basic HTML tagging. Uh, the next step involved transforming that plain text into a spreadsheet, which was done with some code written by Michael Scalak, one of my colleagues at Dickinson. And that uh, allows us to then have a spreadsheet with uh, lemmas in one column, work titles in another, location data, and then the actual word form and then the tags. Now this can, of course, then be sorted by location to give us the unscrambled concordance uh, in the form of a, uh, of a, uh, of a lemmatized text. We can then uh, combine that with data from the bridge. Uh, their, uh, their alignment with bridge lemmas allows us to then add definitions and full uh, uh, display lemmas, that is principal parts for the verbs and, uh, and so forth, to make a complete uh, dictionary out of it. All right, so that concordance liberation, that's ongoing. There are many other, uh, several other ones that we've done and more that are coming. I think Cicero's Letters is, is next on the way. Uh, we've done Bead, Rob Hardy's edition of Bead was just only made possible by this concordance liberation uh, angle that allowed us to have the running lists that are accurate and um, uh, with good definitions. All right, another uh, phase here, another sort of project that came up in the context, of not a DCC, but a DCO, Dickinson Classics Online, is the uh, Chinese language uh, you know, version of DCC. And uh, if we're gonna do running lists in DCO, I figured, well, we must, we really should have a Chinese Latin dictionary. Uh, turns out there is a very large one <laughs> uh, done by Joaquim, about something like 30,000 lemmas done by Joaquim Afonso Gonsalves, the missionary in 1841. He was working in Macau at a seminary there and trained generations of missionaries and worked with uh, many um, Chinese uh, uh, colleagues to create this extremely full, uh, it's like every fish name, and you know, it's like Latin words I've never heard of are in this dictionary. So it's a terrific resource. It looks kind of like this. Um, it, it's a little quirky and they, well, you've got traditional Chinese characters for one thing, and also the, the display limits are not the, to the modern standard. So he, he uses the second singular as the second principal part of a verb. So there's some quirks with this. We were able to get a physical copy from Princeton and scan it at uh, Dickinson. It's a very rare book. There were three copies in the US and uh, one of them was checked out <laughs> at Princeton. Uh, but they were very kind to lend us this book so we could photograph it and make a really high quality PDF. Ran that through Abbey Fine Reader. That um, allows us to spit out the data in Excel, but there's a lot of cleaning and proofreading that has to be done. So 
many students have worked on this, uh, as I'll show you some pictures in a minute, but that's a, that's a big step, honestly, a lot of proofreading and data cleaning. Uh, in terms of the leveraging with modern data, we're aligning Gonsalves' headwords with Morpheus' headwords. And this is the uh, set of Latin headwords that's used by Perseus and is also used by Logeon. So it, it's kind of a default linked open data standard for Latin lexicography, Greek lexicography as well. Uh, and so that's another big sort of hand work process is that, that lemma alignment, which is not easy to do. Uh, but uh, given enough time, we, we're, we're accomplishing it. The, that will allow the data then to be shared and, and sort of talk to other projects like Logeon and Perseus, uh, in addition to being used in the DCO website, and um, we have also a mobile application. So here are some of the display lemmas. We uh, took these from Logeon, uh, which has wonderful display lemmas, and the bridge is providing some English definitions that can then be added once the Morpheus alignment is completed. Um, in DCO, it will look like this. It's gonna have its own little interface with um, you know, Morpheus headers as the keywords, but then the Gonsalves definitions. And, um, and then, as I mentioned, Laura, Lara Freimark has created a, an Android mobile application which we can distribute globally uh, once this whole thing is done, um, along with you know, English definitions as well, because many Chinese uh, learners of Latin like to sort of triangulate with English. So having actually the three languages is, is optimum for them. Uh, here's some, some of the folks who've helped with this. This has drawn tremendous uh, enthusiasm and energy from a wide variety of scholars, some high school students. Uh, this is a group working under the wonderful Liz Penland. And um, there's Liz again with some, some of her other students. We've also had undergraduates at Dickinson and uh, graduate students at uh, especially the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, but also University of Chicago, uh, Penn, and uh, Catholic University and elsewhere. So this has really been, I think there's about 30 people working on this right now. It's just an amazing um, uh, sort of team of folks who are making this happen. All right, so what are some other possibilities? Uh, Latin synonyms, there's really no good digitized dictionary of Latin synonyms out there where you can look up, you know, give me all the Latin words for sword or something. And, that's a to me is a need it could be useful for folks who want to speak latin the active latin community could really use a synonym dictionary also useful for literary criticism uh, what synonyms did caesar have available for a particular word that he didn't use uh, and there's not a lot of easy way to really get at that right now i think a good first step would be digitizing Durderlein's latin synonyms which is a, a condensation of a six volume work that he did uh, in the 19th century and it's been translated into english I'm working on this with some students now, uh, and what we're doing is taking Durderlein's lemmas and um, adding display lemmas from Logeon, and then using LASLA data to give us um, information about how frequent the various synonyms are. These are words for different types of actors, and um, you know you can tell that one particular one is quite rare, uh, but other ones are more common. The last of the data is also broken up by prose and poetry, so we can tell which are more common in prose and which in poetry. That can give you a sense of how, um, you know, how the words actually sounded. Uh, were, were, was it a lofty poetic synonym? Was it more a prosaic one the poets would avoid uh, for whatever reason? You can see for word for enemy, we've got some of them that are actually quite rare in poetry. Aguasarius could be metrical issues there, but um, uh, for whatever reason, and then hostis occurs roughly equally in uh, poetry and prose. And you can express this as a score, a poeticism score from one to zero, one being uh, exclusively in poetry and zero being exclusively in prose. Uh, so that's a, an example where it's useful for literary criticism and for uh, sort of active Latin if you can uh, digitize it and add some modern data. All right, another project that is I'm very excited about, and this speaks to this issue of globalizing the classics, is the uh, uh, a massive work called the Cursus Literaturae Sinicae. This is created by Angelo Zottoli, who was a uh, was a missionary working in Shanghai, spent most of his adult life in more of his life than not in in Shanghai, uh, training missionaries, and um, he. Not only, uh, the photograph, by the way, is not Zotoli. Couldn't find one of Zotoli, but Matteo Ricci, who's the Zotoli of perhaps an earlier generation. Uh, think of him as the uh, one of the great uh, missionaries, European missionaries of an earlier generation. 
and scholars. Of course, he learned Chinese. Zotli didn't just learn Chinese. He learned, um, he, he did the entire educational curriculum and passed the first European to do so, the extremely rigorous final exams, the civil service exams that uh, test knowledge of, of the entire tradition. So uh, he published a, as I say, a five volume work that is kind of a lobe of Chinese literature with Latin translations. Um, and you can see the traditional characters on the right and a Latin translation with some notes. It includes other reference resources like lists of different um, you know, household implements and everything. Uh, so this is, this is a massive encyclopedic work that is really one of the monuments of, of modern, early modern sinology that uh, sinologists are still, still really studying to get, a, to get grips with. The if digitized, this could give us a fantastic reservoir of Latin that would be of great interest to the growing community of folks in China who are studying Latin. So uh, I think this is a, has extraordinary potential to really bring um, the Latin tradition and Chinese tradition in, in dialogue. Uh, you could study cultural translation. What are certain like, value terms or literary concepts uh, in both languages? How are they expressed differently? Uh, where are the gaps between the and where the where's the overlap in the different um, uh, ideas? So I see this as a as, an, as a really astonishingly beautiful uh, important resource that should be digitized and I think should be uh, published in three languages: uh, Latin, Chinese, and English, uh, to really have maximum effect. But that's a big project for the future that I'm hoping to to get to. Um, I'm going to post my slides here in the comment section so you can see, follow down these links if you happen to be interested in that. Uh, all right, one more, and that's uh, Leo Africanus. Uh, Leo Africanus was an early modern writer uh, who was a, uh, spoke Arabic, was his native language, and he wrote a, a well-known work on the geography of North Africa in several volumes that originally came out in Italian. He was, he was a merchant and traveler who was uh, captured by pirates, <laughs> sold as a slave, and then he converted to Catholicism uh, later in his life and, and wrote a bunch of stuff that was published in Latin and Italian. Uh, so this one is a smaller work about Latin writer, uh, sorry, about Arabic writers. De Guiris Illustribus Apud Arabes. And uh, it, apparently the, the Arabic original has been lost. Maybe it's languishing in some library, still to be discovered. Uh, but it has been printed, but not since 1768. So what if we could digitize this, maybe pair it with an Arabic version, um, and I think that would be of interest to Arabic-speaking students of Latin, something that they could um, uh, study with and, and benefit from as they're getting to know that language. All right, so this is just some examples. I'm sure you can think of many others. Uh, the moral of the story for me is that we can use the past of philology the glorious past of philology uh, to create a global future uh, without sitting around waiting for some fabulously learned scholar to do the job. Like we, can, we can start now. Secondly, uh, I would say if you're thinking about doing this kind of work, the key is serve readers. Um, think of the community of readers you'd like to serve. Put them in possession of what could help them. Uh, and then finally, the, um, I want to argue that this is the kind of work that is compatible with a quote unquote normal scholarly career. You don't have to go 100% into DH, become digital humanist and brand yourself that way. Uh, this is really, I think, an aspect of teaching, an aspect of scholarship um, that uh, anybody can do uh, given the, the tools available to us. And I urge you to get involved if you can. All right, uh, thank you so much for your attention. I hope this has been helpful. Please reach out to me uh, by email if you'd like to discuss any of the projects here in more detail. Thanks, bye-bye.